well, there was a lot going on in the day of Zephaniah, and uh, he was a mighty preacher, and the effects of his sermons were vast. And so I'd like to uh, get into uh, the book of Zephaniah, uh, but first let me pray. Our Father and our God, we come before your throne today with adoration and praise, knowing, Lord, that uh, you delight in our study of your word. And I pray, God, that today you would meet us here, that you would uh, open up our hearts to receive the, the spiritual food that you have for us, and that you would teach us much as we look into the words of Zephaniah. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, uh, uh, Zephaniah, um, part of Minor Prophets with a Major Voice. So um, hopefully you can see my screen there. Uh, great. Um, now what's interesting, Zephaniah, probably a fair amount of Christians might fail to recognize that Zephaniah is even in the, in the Bible. In fact, there's a trick that um, pastors play on their congregations when they stand in the pulpit and they say, uh, can you turn to the first chapter of Hezekiah? Well, there is no book Hezekiah in the Old Testament. Hezekiah, of course, was an Old Testament king, but there's no book that bears his name. And so what you have is uh, lots of people start flipping through their Bibles trying to find Hezekiah and they can't find it. Um, and so there's a lesson that we should be, of course, familiar with our Bibles. But Zephaniah is certainly in, in, the, in, in the Bible, and it's uh, in the latter uh, fraction of the Old Testament. It's one of the minor prophets, and minor not speaking of um, importance of message, but just volume. So Zephaniah is one of those minor prophets because his book is small, um, but he has a lot to say. And before we really get into who Zephaniah was, um, I will say that he was a mighty preacher whose sermons brought on great reform. So he was a, a, a Reformation preacher uh, in the land of Judah um, at the time of the reign of Josiah. And Josiah is going to be used of God to bring about reforms uh, in the day of great spiritual decay among the people of Judah. So I want to open with a question, and I want you to think about your answer to this question. Um, who, who do you think is a great preacher, and what makes them, what has made them great? So I want you to think of somebody other than the preachers at Central, because I know that you think that we're all great. Right. But <laughs> someone other than at Central. But what preacher, whether it's someone that you attended their church personally, or you read about, or you heard through a recording, you know, I know that there are several of you that like different ones on the television today, and that's good, that's fine. Um, uh, and I can tell you whether their uh, doctrine is sound or not, if you're interested. But um, what makes a good preacher? What makes a good preacher? And, uh, and, and who, who do you think has been a good preacher in history? So I wanna ask you to, to answer that a little bit later in our lesson. But Zephaniah was certainly a great preacher. Um, yeah, it's part of the Bible that maybe we don't venture into all that much. When we think about having our devotions, when we read the scripture, we might gravitate to the New Testament, or we might gravitate to the book of Genesis or Exodus or Numbers. Um, but the lesser known prophets, um, we might skip over. Well, Zephaniah is one Certainly, we should never skip over any parts of Scripture. We should read it all. Um, but Zephaniah might be one of the lesser-known prophets of the Old Testament. His name means Yahweh hides. Yahweh hides. 
and he ministered during Josiah's reign, which was sometime between 640 BC and 609 BC. So there for about 30 years. Um, and so you say, well, why are those dates significant? One, Josiah was used by God to bring about uh, reforms in the land of Judah, um, kind of the last ditch effort before God would uh, send judgment upon Judah. And in 586 BC, so just about 20, 25 years after Zephaniah's ministry and after the reforms that J Josiah brought on, um, then Jerusalem would be conquered and the, and the people of Judah would be hauled off into exile in the land of Babylon. And that's significant. Um, in 722 BC is when the northern kingdom was hauled off into exile by the Assyrians. And then basically 150 years later in 586, Judah was hauled off into exile by the Babylonians. And the Babylonians, of course, conquered the Assyrians and became the superpower. Uh, and then all of Israel was in captivity in Babylon um, for 40 years. Um, so uh, Zephaniah's name means Yahweh hides. And um, Yahweh, uh, the Lord hides. So Yahweh is another name. It is God's covenant-making name in the Old Testament. The term Yahweh is the name that God introduced himself as uh, when he introduced himself to Moses in the burning bush. And uh, he said, go to my people, go to Pharaoh, and tell Pharaoh to release my people from the 400-year uh, time of slavery. And uh, Moses said, well, when I go, who do I say has sent me. And um, God said, I am has sent you. Uh, tell them that I am has sent you. So Yahweh means I am, and it is God's covenant making name. And it, it, it means the all sufficient one, the one who is completely independent from all things, who is sovereign, uh, and who um, is able to do whatever he wants. So Zephaniah's name means Yahweh hides. So there's a big theme of judgment in the book of Yahweh. He ministered during Josiah's reign, as I said, those dates. Um, he is possibly related to King Hezekiah. And interesting, in a time when Judah did not have good kings, you have jo uh, Zephaniah, who is God's spokesperson. He's a prophet. And that's who prophets were. They were spokespeople for God. And the Holy Spirit rested upon prophets, priests, and kings in the Old Testament. So um, Zephaniah had a very important position among God's people. And he is related in some way to King Hezekiah. Zephaniah 1 verses 1 Verse 1 says, The word of the Lord that came to Zephaniah, the son of Cushi, the son of Geldiah, son of Aramiah, son of Hezekiah, in the days of Josiah, the son of Ammon, the king of Judah. So some scholars believe that this Hezekiah that is referred to here um, is a, a distant relative of Zephaniah. So Zephaniah is related to the good king Hezekiah, and then he's preaching during the time of Josiah, which was another good king. They say, well, what a big deal, two good kings, uh, but they don't come back to back. In fact, um, Hezekiah and Josiah are two of the bright spots in an otherwise very spiritually dismal time uh, among the people of Judah. Now, as I said to you earlier, his sermons were used by God to bring about reforms. So Zephaniah's message was one of judgment against the people of Judah and judgment of the nations. And so um, it was kind of a wake-up call. Um, 
probably very similar to John the Baptist in his day. John the Baptist preached a baptism of repentance. John the Baptist used words such as, you brood of vipers, um, who told you to flee from the wrath to come? Zephaniah probably had a similar message um, as uh, uh, compared to John the Baptist. Um, Zephaniah denounces syncretistic religion. You say, well, what is that? Syncretism means the blending of several different types of religion. And so, and they're all operating together. So it wasn't that the people of Judah did not tip their hat to the God of the Old Testament, Yahweh, but they said, well, we're going to follow the Baal, or we're going to follow the Asherah, or we're going to follow Molech. Um, and so they kind of took on an eclectic spiritual identity, and they believed in worshiping many gods. And if we're not careful, the United States can become like that. Uh, no doubt we're a diverse society, and we welcome people from all cultures and all religious backgrounds, and um, America is the melting pot. But at the same time, we should never forget that um, in, in having a diverse society, as Christians, we believe firmly and strongly that the Lord is God. Um, as it says in the book of Isaiah, I am the Lord, there is no other. And so um, we live alongside of people that worship differently than we do, but we have a strong conviction of the truth, and it also fuels our evangelism. Um, so Zephaniah denounces syncretistic religion, as, um, as I will read a quote to you a little bit later in our study. Um, the people of Judah believe that, well, we'll take a little bit of pagan uh, Assyrian religion, we'll take a little bit of Canaanite religion, we'll take a little bit of this, we'll take a little bit of that, and they said, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll basically be about this hodgepodge of divinity um, to cover all the bases. But that never works because God demands loyalty. The scripture says that he's a jealous God. He says uh, that you shall have no other gods before me, and you shall not make unto thee a graven image. And both of those commandments were violated grossly in the time of Zephaniah. Um, Nineveh had not yet been destroyed, so Zephaniah's message is prior to 612 BC. So if we were to take a look at Zephaniah 2, 13, we would read um, Zephaniah 2, 13 says, and he will stretch out his hand against the north and destroy Assyria, and he will make Nineveh a desolation, a dry waste like the desert. So if you know the story of the great city Nineveh, um, the prophet Jonah was sent there to preach to the people and to call for repentance, and they did repent in sackcloth and ashes, and um, that delayed their destruction by a few years. But sin always finds its way back, and so the people again fell away from God in the land of Nineveh, and uh, the Lord brought great destruction in 612 BC there. And so, as we see Zephaniah preaching against Assyria and against Nineveh, we know that that has to be prior to its desolation, prior to its destruction by the Babylonians. Um, so, there's a little bit about Zephaniah. Um, he prophesied judgment against Judah and the nations, but he also predicted the future blessing of the nations. So, it's not that ne uh, Ze Zephaniah has a doom and gloom message all the way through. Certainly, judgment is part of his message, but also blessing is part of Zephaniah's message, and that comes in chapter 3. 
Um, the truth is, is that Judah was a mess. They were worshiping false gods, the false gods of Baal and Molech and the host of heaven, as we read in Zephaniah 1, verses 4 and 5. It says there, I will stretch out my hand against Judah and against all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and I will cut them off from this place, the remnant of Baal and the name of the idolatrous priest, along with the priests and those who bow down on the roofs to the host of heaven, those who bow down and swear to the Lord <clears throat> and yet swear by Milcom. So um, God is declaring war, not just on the people of Judah, but also on the gods that they're serving. Now, Zephaniah would have been familiar with the messages of Amos and Isaiah and other prophets that came before him. So we should understand that the activity of God and, and bringing the message of God to God's people, it does not contain, a, it is not found in a vacuum, but rather Zephaniah would have been familiar with the message of Isaiah that would have come before him and the message of Amos. Kind of an outline of the book in chapter one, it's the impending doom of Jerusalem, and that would take place in 586 B.C. Um, also in chapter 2 and at the beginning of chapter 3, we see that God's judgment includes the nations, the known world at that time. So he's going to pronounce judgment against Philistia, um, Moab, Ammon, the Cushites, and Assyria. So you're talking about all the, the, um, the different people groups, the different tribes of the Canaanites, okay? And, um, and then restoration and blessing are going to be preached in chapter 3. And probably the most well-known verse in Zephaniah is uh, Zephaniah chapter 3, verse 17, where it talks about that the Lord rejoices over his people and he dances because of them. That's an interesting picture, isn't it? God dancing, uh, God full of joy over his people. So his anger is not for a lifetime, uh, but his joy uh, comes in the morning. So, um, an occasion for reform. Second Kings 22 verses, uh, chapter 22, verse 3 through 23, 7, uh, talks about how uh, the book of the law was rediscovered in the temple. And this was um, an occasion of great um, revival among God's people because they had, um, people have forgotten God's law. And so I'd like to read from 2 Kings 23. Then the king sent, and all the elders of Judah and Jerusalem were gathered to him, and the king went up to the house of the Lord, and with him all the men of Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem and the priests and the prophets and all the people, both small and great. And he read in their hearing all the words of the book of the covenant that had been found in the house of the Lord. So... Um, what would happen if God took away our Bibles? Would we suffer? Um, the people of Judah suffered because they had lost sight of God's commandments and uh, God's law. So um, we ought to consider ourselves blessed that we live in a country where we have readily uh, accessible copies of the scriptures. Bill Sabate, who joins our study today, Bill is uh, part of the Gideons International, and the Gideons is a Christian businessman's group that dedicates their lives to the spreading of God's word and uh, dedicates their ministry to that. And so the Gideons, of course, are responsible for placing a copy of the scriptures in hospitals and in hotel rooms and maybe you have come across those in your, uh, the places that you've stayed or if you've been hospitalized. 
That is no small thing. In fact, there are testimonies of how those scriptures um, have spoken into the lives of those that were ready to commit suicide. They've gone to a hotel room, they've checked themselves in, and they were ready to take their own life. But they've opened up the nightstand and they've pulled out the copy of the scriptures, and people have been saved. People have come to faith in Christ as a result of reading from the Gideon Bibles that are placed there strategically. And so uh, we should be thankful for a, um, a group like the Gideons. So the, the book of the law was found in the temple. And the king stood by the pillar and made a covenant before the Lord to walk after the Lord and to keep his commandments and his testimonies and his statutes with all his heart and all his soul to perform the words of this covenant that were written in this book and all the people joined in the covenant. And the king commanded Hilkiah, the high priest and the priest of the second order and the keepers of the threshold to bring out of the temple of the Lord all the vessels made for Baal, for Asherah, and for all the host of heaven. And he burned them outside Jerusalem in the fields of the Kidron and carried their ashes to Bethel. So here it, we see the reforms taking place. Um, it's revival. It's an awakening among the people that they know that, hey, we've been living wrongly and we've been doing wrongly. And it started with uh, the king uh, and the high priest. And so they brought all the articles that had been put in the temple that had encouraged them to worship other gods. They brought those things out and they burned them. And um, we serve a God who allows U-turns. We serve a God who welcomes people back if they recognize their sin and they turn from it. And so 2 Kings 22 and 23 tells us that the book of the law was rediscovered in the temple. Secondly, King Josiah is used by God to bring about reforms in religious life in Judah. So he's one of the bright spots. Other kings like Manasseh go down in history as being awful and turning God's people away from the Lord. Um, but King Josiah is one of the good ones and he ministers at the time of Zephaniah. As I said before, Zephaniah was a John the Baptist of the time. He preached repentance and getting right with God, uh, which brought on these reforms. And he also preached judgment uh, against Philistia, Moab, Ammon, Cushites, and Assyria. Now let's stop right there and let's uh, unmute everybody. Um, and what has, who has been uh, your favorite preacher um, in history? Who has had the most influence on you? And what made his messages particularly powerful? It's hard to pick a particular person. Right. Uh, thinking of people where you can only go through their readings, as far as I know, I think of somebody like uh, Tozer uh -huh. or um, uh, J.I. Packer. Mm -hmm. When you think of modern day preachers, at least ones that are still, uh, we might see their TV or whatever, I think of either Andy Stanley or Charles Stanley, David Jeremiah, um, Jeffries. Um, and one of the things they all seem to have in common, that's why it's hard to pick who's a favorite, is they talk about the Bible. You see a lot of uh, uh, preachers, ministers, who manage to avoid mentioning it at all. Mm -hmm. Or if they do, it's almost as an afterthought. Uh -huh. And I think that's part of the thing that makes it um, powerful, because it's not necessarily just dealing with topical events or how to manage your money mm -hmm. so i don't have a particular favorite so i will go some of the ones i'll say it's to uh david some of the, the uh writings i've seen of uh john stout mm. um seem to uh to resonate okay 
Good, good. That's yeah, great. You mentioned A.W. Tozer. They said that he was a profound, uh, um, he, that his ministry rose out of his times alone with God. And he spent um, many hours every day in prayer. <clears throat> and um, that there's a story of how uh, he uh, was talking to a um, group of preachers uh, and he said, uh, if you ever want to find me, I'll be down uh, 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 at this particular place at, at 530 in the morning. And they went down there and there he was on his face praying before God. So uh, his whole ministry rose out of his quiet times with the Lord. Um, yeah. Anybody else want to comment on uh, powerful preachers in your past and what made them so? Well, I would have to agree with Phil that I don't think I could ever come up with one okay. particular, but I think, you know, as far as just recently, I think our Sunday school class has done several videos with Timothy Keller. Oh yeah. And, um, I've enjoyed him. I mean, of course, people said, you know, they're, they're using the Bible. It's all based in scripture and God's, you know, in God's word. Yeah. But I think what makes him interesting or whatever is he, it's very relational. It's very, he's relating it to my life. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a key for me that it's very, and he doesn't, and I would think for others, he doesn't set himself above me. He's my equal. Mm hmm you know, has the same struggles or ideas that I have. Uh huh. Good. That's great. Anybody else want to comment? Well, when Lois and I uh, had a house in Florida, we used to go to a Presbyterian church down there, and his name was Tim Halverson. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's very, uh, very interesting because he was able to and uh, put it in your life on a day-to-day -day basis. And he would talk about programs uh, from the Bible, things that uh, would be there that you'd be able to relate to things that are going on uh, every day in your life uh, currently. Uh -huh. He since retired and moved to, moved to Chicago. Oh. Uh, but this particular church uh, is an all-inclusive church. Um, there are a lot of uh, 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 different types of people that go to this church. Um, and it's a very um, open church to everybody that's there. He started that movement when he was there for a number of, he's there for a, a long, long period of time. And they're continuing it now that he has uh, departed. Uh, but he was able to take take an everyday lesson and turn it into something that you could relate to in your life and what's going on. Mm. And that, that was important to both Lois and me. That's great. That's great. So all of you have commented on uh, how these preachers, um, you know, were able to discuss the Bible and relate it to, to everyday life and make it relevant, uh, and uh, they were humble, um, approachable, um, and also able to speak to many different types of people. Uh, that's good, that's good, that's great. Well, uh, looks like I have my work cut out for me, so. <laughs> um, okay, so here's the sad situation. Uh, here's the spiritual climate uh, of Judah at the time of um, Zephaniah, or shortly before Zephaniah. And this comes from the book, The Old Testament Speaks, written many years ago. In fact, I think it was written in about 1980 uh, by uh, Old Testament scholar Sam Schultz. And... Um, says, true religion in Judah not only declined after Hezekiah's death, 
but was replaced by gross idolatry. Manasseh, that was the king of Judah at the time, Manasseh erected altars to Baals, made Asherim. Those are um, uh, idols. Um, and I'll, I'll get to Asherim here in a moment. And worshipped the host of heaven, even using the temple for these idolatrous practices. By offering his sons in sacrificial rites, yeah, he offered his, uh, he performed child sacrifice of his own children, if you could imagine. By offering his sons in sacrificial rites, conforming to heathen customs and shedding innocent blood in Jerusalem, Manasseh led his people into such excessive sin that Judah was far worse than the nations God had expelled from Canaan in times past. Now, let's stop right there. When you back up several hundred years to the time of Joshua and Joshua's conquest of Canaan, and he fought the battle of Jericho and he fought other battles and he was told to annihilate the Canaanites, man, men, women, boys, and girls, um, and to, to take, you know, to, to completely destroy uh, those who occupied the land. The reason for that is that God was judging the Canaanites for their sin. It's not because God's a racist God. It's not because, um, you know, he just has a bent toward other people um, than the Jews. No, it was because it was judgment for their sin. And he used his own people to judge the Canaanites for their sin. Well, here, Judah has become like the Canaanites. They have incorporated the religion of the Canaanites, and they have included idolatry. They have included worship of the Baal. They've included um, the um, worship of Asherah and uh, the god Molech. Molech is infamous among the Canaanites because he was the god that... Um, that child sacrifice was part of the worship of Molech. In order for um, there not to be any famine or in order for there not to be a drought, uh, the, 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 the worshipers would go to Molech and there would be a fire there and they would take their, their very own children and toss them into the fire. And uh, it's an awful picture uh, of how um, a people can be so spiritually demented and brainwashed into thinking that the killing of their own blood uh, is accept an acceptable spiritual practice. Um, so here is a picture of an Asherah. And an Asherah, now, you look at that, there's nothing attractive about that at all. Uh, but that was, uh, that was an idol at the time of Zephaniah. And um, the Asherah, these were placed in different places. Uh, we read from 2 Kings, it was placed in the temple. It was also placed uh, along the countryside. Sometimes the Asherah would be um, these big poles that um, would be in the form of a, of, of a person and uh, they would make them out of trees. And uh, now you noticed that the, the, the physical features of you've got a human face and then since we're all adults, I can say this, um, rather voluptuous uh, looking uh, figure there. That's because the Asherah was considered the, go uh, the fertility goddess, the fertility goddess. And so part of the uh, worship practices for there to be temple prostitutes that uh, the people in, in order to worship the Asherah would uh, enter into sexual immorality with the temple prostitutes. And so sexual life and religious life were intertwined in uh, ancient Judah. 
uh, and this can be said, that this is almost like a, a common denominator among, among many pagan uh, religious practice, uh, because we see that in ancient Corinth. I, I've, been, I've had the pleasure of going to ancient Corinth in 2010 and in 2014, and um, you have the, uh, the bathhouse that's in the city of ancient Corinth. You can walk around the ruins and see these things. Um, but you have the bathhouse where the temple prostitutes would hang out, shaved heads, both male and female, and they would hang out at the bathhouse and they would walk through the, the town, through the city, and they would have uh, on their sandals or on their feet, they would have painted arrows. Um, and so wherever the temple prostitute walked, he or she would welcome people to follow them to the Acro Corinth, which was a big hill overlooking the city of Corinth. And, a, and, uh, and atop that hill was the uh, temple of um, Aphrodite, I believe. And you would go to the temple of Aphrodite and you would have sex. And that would be part of the worship ceremony as they worshiped Aphrodite. So, um, but things were similar in the days of Zephaniah because they, uh, they had the Asherah that um, was right along the lines of, of, of pagan religious practice. Um, so God, God abhors the twisting of, uh, of his good gifts. God has given mankind sex, and it is to be used as a, a gift of intimacy between a man and his wife, and also for the procreation uh, for, for bearing children. But Satan has taken God's gift and twisted it, and so that's why we have such things as pornography, and human trafficking and prostitution and and uh, many other things that that go along with that that twist God's good gift of sex, um, and that's been that way for millennia. But uh, so this is the reason why God is going to pour out His judgment upon Judah for their idolatry and their immorality. And he's going to bring judgment to Judah, and he's also going to bring judgment to the nations. And so um, this is the reason why God, some 25, 30 years later, would carry the people of Judah off into exile. Um, but Zephaniah also contains a message of hope, and uh, that God would one day rejoice over his people. The prophet gives God's people a glimpse into the future to motivate them to live their lives pleasing to God. And so through the prophet's message, the people of God would humble themselves and they would repent. And Josiah would remove the idols from the temple and tear down the high places where some of these things would take place. Um, and Zephaniah's message was a simple one. Comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. That's been used by preachers uh, over the years that our job is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. Afflict the comfortable meaning uh, to uh, when people become numb to the things of God, when they've closed their ears, when they're too attached to their own lifestyle and their own plan, rather than conforming themselves to God's will, then they need to be afflicted. They need to be, uh, uh, the, the, a, a pin needs to prick their hearts. Josiah would rid Judah of Assyrian influence prior to 609 BC. So he, uh, that was the king uh, at the time and he would be used by God to bring about revival. Uh, but it would only last for a short time because Jerusalem's going to fall in 586 B.C. 
So um, the most well-known verse from Zephaniah, which would be Zephaniah 317, which reads, The Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. So this is the picture of uh, God's reaction to his people. And when you think about it, revival usually is earmarked by the praise of God's people toward God. But here, the picture is the opposite. Whereas um, um, God is rejoicing over his people. So um, God is expressing his love for his people. And so I think that that's a beautiful picture. I was reminded, um, I, I lost a friend um, last week, Darren Patrick, who was a nationally known preacher. And he and I went to undergrad together at Southwest Baptist University. And Darren um, uh, died uh, tragically last Thursday. Um, but in a message that I was viewing online by Darren, he said, um, what do you think God's expression is when we pray? And he said, most people think that God's expression when we pray might be something like, you know, impatient, angry, mad, frustrated. But here we see in Zephaniah 317 that God's expression is one of exuberance, one of joy, one of happiness, one of laughter, one of loud singing. So um, that's the picture of God that I wanna that I wanna remember. Well, let me pray for us. Thank you for your time today. Let, let, let's go to Thank God you, in prayer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we've had together today. Thank you for your love. Thank you for your care. Thank you, Lord, that your word says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty one who will save. He will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. He will exult over you with loud singing. Lord, we do rejoice that you take that disposition uh, over us because of Christ. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd bless each one here today. And Lord, bring an end to this coronavirus that we might be able to serve you in bigger and better ways. We trust in you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.